morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. I'm Barbara Kaufman, and I'm the steward for the arts sector at the Charter for Compassion. So uh, when you think about a charter, you normally think about a document. Um, a charter is actually a document, or it starts as a document. And the Charter for Compassion started as a document, too. It was put together with the leadership of Karen Armstrong. And Karen Armstrong is a, an author and religious scholar. And in 2008, she did a TED Talk in which she described what her wish was for the world. And that was to have a Charter for Compassion that everybody would feel comfortable signing on to. And that was 10 years ago. This is the 10th anniversary of the Charter for Compassion. And we now have more than 400 member cities. I think it's at 440, the number of cities. We have 2,200 organizations in 54 countries. We now have 12 sectors at the Charter, and they are arts, business, education, environment, healthcare, religion, spirituality, and interfaith, peace, science and research, restorative justice, social justice, social services, and women and girls. And we also have um, CEI, which is the Charter Educational Institute. So that's what this program is in favor of spreading compassion around the world. And I've got a guest today that is one of the most compassionate people that I know um, in terms of her work and the planet. Now, the, the Charter talks about 3D compassion for, for self, for others, and for the planet. And Jennifer is really the epitome of that. So Jennifer Wilhite is, she's a PhD, she's, a, she's an author, she's a spiritual ecologist, I love that term, and the founder of Teal Arbor Story. She compassionate, compassionately supports people crea people's creative process by drawing from nature's wisdom. Jennifer works as a consultant, a peacemaker, a healer, and a writer. She's also a longtime hospice, sacred vigiling, and bereavement volunteer. In addition to her individual practice with clients, Jennifer offers presentations, workshops, courses, trainings, and retreats. Her books, articles, and blogs focus on the human and nature relationship, what she calls the inner and outer landscape. Dr. Wilhite is a faculty member and partner of the Charter for Compassion's Educational Institute, an active board member of several, several environmental peace-building, compassion-focused, and interfaith organizations, and has presented her work at the widely attended International Parliament of World Religions. Her most recent book includes Wean Seals and Snowy Summits. And she also wrote Writing on the Landscape, in 2017 and when Jennifer's not researching writing or working she hikes makes beauty in photographs natural landscapes reads travels internationally as much as possible and expresses her love of nature through creative arts Jennifer thrives in the beautiful Pacific Northwest landscape where she lives if you want to look at her website it's at tealarborstories.com and I want to welcome Jennifer I'm so glad you're with us today Good morning. Well, actually, it's afternoon, right? <laughs> or is it? Afternoon. I'm not sure. Yeah. Good yeah. Here. Good afternoon, everybody. I am so excited to be here. Um, and that was a really wonderful introduction. Thank you, Barbara. <laughs> I love the Charter. Um, I have been involved with the Charter for Compassion since 2014, and it happened by accident um, that, that I got involved living in another place that isn't here, um, and I instantly felt at home. I instantly felt people who had values mm -hmm. in common and a purpose and a direction in, in common, um, and it, in a way, it, and with a focus that, that was truly on compassion, love, caring for one another, offering kindness. Um, and so it, it feels very natural um, to be involved again in a, in a charter endeavor. So thank you very much, Barbara, for inviting me to be part of Creativity Camp. Um, I don't know what ages of people we have on this call. I primarily my work is with adults, though recently kids have been finding their way to my work. Um, and so I am very, very um, excited to offer today both some readings, which I will start with, and then some 
uh, images. And then after that, I would like to describe how you, um, the, the participant in this um, uh, webinar, can actually do some of these practices yourself with whatever you have around you at home. Um, I think every practice, every um, activity, uh, creative and otherwise that, that we'll be talking about and that you'll be seeing today um, are things that you can do right in your backyard or right in your kitchen, um, as, as the case may be. And you'll understand that when the images come up. So I would like to start, I'm going to read um, a few things. I, I have a lot planned, so I'll just start with a few. And then if there's time at the end, maybe I'll read some more. Um, but I'm going to read a piece from my blog. I will do that third. Um, and then I'm going to start with readings from my um, two latest books. This is the 2017 one that Barbara referenced. This is actually, if you're stuck in a creative project or with a, particularly with a writing project, this book, Writing on the Landscape, um, might be useful to you. And it's just chock full of practices and activities, um, some of which are actually fun, <laughs> that can help you um, kind of boost your creativity. And then the other book is um, my co-authored volume with Stephen B. Jones, PhD. We put this book out last year, um, not even a year ago, about eight months ago. And so I'll read a little bit from this book as well. And I will start with a reading from Writing on the Landscape. The landscape is bliss for me. Through deserts and meadows, seven continents of flora and fauna, ponds, springs, snowfields, rivers, glaciers, estuaries, the tundra of mountain peaks, windstorms or calm, deep within caves or deep below the surface of the sea, in, atop, below, or beside deciduous and coniferous trees, in four seasons, over five decades, I have sought out natural places. I abide in them. My hand reaches for the fur, nape, or soft breath of non-human creatures. I measure days, weeks, and months by adding a small object from nature to a round pallet each day. My body is well, healthy, whole, strong, invigorated, relaxed in nature's sweet places. My emotions become smooth, less intense, when I allow myself to rest in nature's havens. My mind becomes fresh and clear or is stimulated by the wealth of knowledge contained in a single stamen, the coyote's eye, the antennae of a slug. My spirit remembers awe and is inspired by frequent prolonged abidance in nature's cathedrals. Work is impossible for me if it does not include some element of ecology. Days off are muted and laid to waste if I cannot get outside to move or sit. Every creative project I have ever aspired to contains either images of or resources from the natural world. My hospice volunteer service revolves around one of the most natural and inescapable earth journeys of all, the dying process. And each time I have needed any kind of healing myself, it is to nature that I turn. Not only that, nature has shown me who I am and what compassion is and how to be free and why it all really matters. The infinite riches in the outdoor nature storehouse mirror the expression of humanity. Oh, wow, Jennifer, we could just listen to you all day. That's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. Oh, me, boy, and that's exactly how I feel. So you're putting my feelings into words, which is the highest compliment you can give a writer. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. That is one of the questions you want to ask me later, I think. Uh, yeah. So um, I have a couple of other things I could read, or we could go into a slideshow. Actually, I'd like to read one more thing. I'll, I'll skip the books for the moment. I'd like to read a blog piece, and then we can move into the slideshow. Is that okay, Barbara? Please, of course. 
Okay, um, so this is a piece I wrote several years ago for a nature center on the East Coast, a place called Tupe Haking. I hope I pronounced that correctly. That's how I say it in my brain now for the last few years. They're a nature center in New Jersey, and um, it was another um, odd coincidence, interesting coincidence um, of meeting somebody through a, a friend who I've never met in person, but we've had this wonderful communication online, emails and other things. And she got me connected with Tuba Haking, who was having a, um, an Arbor Day ceremony several years ago. And they asked me if I would write a piece that then ended up being performed by a New York City actress um, uh, during the, the course of this event. So here's the written piece. Um, and I, 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 it's called We Are Trees. And the reason I really wanted to read it today, especially before we get into the images, is because I feel for myself when I'm doing something creative, when I'm making art, when I'm helping other people or guiding other people through creative projects using nature-based um, uh, resources and inspiration, um, it, it reconnects us. It re-sews us back in with the fabric of all life, not just humanity. Um, and so I will read this piece, it's one page. Um, we are trees. We are trees, yes, all of us, living season to season, gaining nourishment from the soil. Air is our very life breath. Yes, we are trees, like branches, our arms reach out wide in ecstatic embrace of the splendor of this earth. Like roots, we ground ourselves in what has meaning a sense of stability. Our torsos are the trunks, our blood, the xylem and phloem that course and flow, skin, bark, leaves, hands that gather what is outside of us to our insides. Fall colors are the adornments we wear to celebrate seasons. Winter's barren limbs mirror to us the deaths and challenges, the losses and transitions, the conflicts and mortal nature of our lives. But spring opens us to the beautiful suppleness, the durability through those torrents that returns us to ourselves. We blossom in thickly petaled white flowers and with our branch arms spread wide, we create a safe haven for all who rest underneath us. We extend ourselves in the summer to bear for those respite seekers the heat of the sun, placing ourselves between sun and dirt so that shade is formed. In the autumn, again, we blaze crimson and gold swatches so firelike, and we bear the winds, filtering them through our singing leaves and limbs so that all below us are spared the brunt and force of it all. Thick hides, thick skin, the ability to stand tall, no matter what adversity blows our way. We are cornerstones of non-human communities and of all the peopled places as well. We drip in the rain, we become statues in the icy snows. We sway to springtime to revelry of bud to blossom to leaf. We hear whispers of romance and children's giggles as summer moves forward to grace us with long days of luscious light. We are bristlecone, wide, stalwart, ancient ones hidden in secret coves in the obscure mountain ways of California. We are elms, oaks, and maples flowing sugar through our veins in spring mediator between the sun's heat and the humans who tromp in grasses near where we stand, East Coast glories. We are teak and banana trees from the tropics. We are the Kapok of Africa, the yew of Europe, the bamboo of Asia, eucalyptus of Australia, the rubber tree of South America. And we are the fossilized impressions of possible trees from early Triassic times in Antarctica. Blessed are we, we trees, we lover of trees, we the community of humans who celebrate Arbor Day. For we feel in trees the resonance of ourselves, the mirror that reminds us how we are rooted and strong, vulnerable in the face of change, resilient always, especially when we remember our inextricable, inextricable interconnection with trees 
with all non-human living beings. When we remember this connection, we remember our own seasons and splendor. Ah. Wonderful. Um, I like the line where you said, uh, returns us to ourselves, you know, reconnecting with that biology. We are biology and part of biology, and to reconnect that is so beautiful. So thank you so much for that. So, very, very welcome. Uh, oh, Jennifer, I know you do um, amazing photographs too, amazing artwork. Do you want to... Um, Take us on a tour through that gallery. I would. And I just as okay. a preface, I'll say these are not um, particularly representative of my favorite images. I tried to provide a little bit of diversity of, of color and, um, and images. Um, it's a silent presentation. You'll see some words every now and then on the screen, but, but don't expect music or talking. It's, it's meant to be a silent journey. Um, it's about five minutes long. Um, and there was something else I was going to say. Oh, I didn't include things in these pieces, uh, in these photographs. I didn't include, for example, some of the, the paintings I've done. I just wanted to keep it um, pretty well focused in what we're talking about today. So I will attempt to share my screen and see how that goes. So you should now be seeing the slideshow. Okay, good.
So Susan Soleil says, thank you, Jennifer. This was a visually stunning meditation. Uh, Jennifer, what I had noticed about your work and and work that in, includes nature like that is that there comes a point when the breathing becomes deeper. Do you experience that as well? And do other people experience that with your work? Um, Breath deepens. I can speak for myself that yes, it does. In fact, though I've been looking at that slideshow a lot in the last few days, as you can imagine, um, making uh, fine tuning it and things, um, even swapped out a few photos this morning. <laughs> um, I, I felt in this watching of it because we were silent and here we are together, 10 or 15 of us um, in one moment, uh, watching these images come rolling across the screen that I did feel some joy and I felt mm -hmm. some calm and yes, like I was just settling in and I hadn't been able to watch it in that way over the last um, uh, weeks and, and especially the last few days. So it was a gift to be able to enjoy it with all of you. Yeah. Yes, it was a gift. And, and I do notice um, the, deeper breathing, especially when we're connected to nature. The other thing I would call that is soul speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely a, a, a language that does speak to a much deeper part of us. Um, and I saw your picture of the mycelium, the um, mushrooms, and it made me think of how we're all mycelium, that we're all connected in that in that same way. You know, we make up that whole biology, as it were, um, the expression of life on the planet. So That's thank right. you so ideally, much. Ideally, in a commensal relationship, right, where we're all mutually benefiting from one another's presence, right? Yeah. And, um, okay, so... <laughs> There was just a comment in the chat I want to read to you. It says, a big calm smile was on my face the whole time and my breathing slowed and deepened. And that's from Melissa. Thanks, Melissa. Yes. yes. So I guess that answers your other question about how it impacts other people. <laughs> Yeah, I think yeah, I think it does. I think it does. Also, the other thing I was thinking is I've told I told you previously that I have Native American on my father's side, and that those things really speak to a different part of me that I probably can't even describe to you. Um, but I have a feeling you hear the same language. Yes. Yeah. 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 So sometimes it's o I I think it's okay. I especially when I'm working with clients, working with people in groups or, or individually. And a lot of the work I do is on Zoom, even before um, shelter in place and, and COVID-19 restrictions. A lot of my work is, is via Zoom because uh, a lot of the clients I served are, serve are not anywhere near me geographically. Um, right. But to have moments where and, and I'll talk about this a little bit later when I'm talking about free rights and nature, um, using nature as, uh, as prompts for writing, that there's something very still-making, quieting mm -hmm. about the natural world's presence in even a Zoom call. And sometimes this mm -hmm. an image I hold up very close to the camera for a period of time so that the, the client, the person on the other end of the Zoom, can actually... Um, uh, use that image in their writing. Sometimes it's something like yesterday I was on with a client and we have a lot of wildlife. Um, I'm, we're very blessed that we live in a, a little bit of a rural place. And so we have wildlife coming through, especially this time of year. And yesterday it was just, I want to say just, um, a, a mama, a mama deer. Um, but she just looked so big. I have a window right here, as you can probably see. And she was <laughs> out there and she was out there at the, the perfect moment that matched something that my client was saying. So I took mm -hmm. the computer and this has happened. I mean, it happened regularly. I was able to take the computer and point the camera out so that she could see who had come into our Zoom session and then to be able to talk about that a little bit with, with that person. Um, it, it happens a lot. It happens a lot in the work. And I think it's mm -hmm. okay if it, makes us gets us still if we move out of you know the sense that we have to produce something we have to be active we have to be moving um 
it's okay to be still. And I think that's one of the gifts that that we don't often talk enough about with the natural world is that calming effect, that that mind quieting effect. And I think when that happens, um, I will dare to say this, that when that happens, we become more receptive to what's mm-hmm. out there and more aware and attentive to that, all of that out there and also all of what's in here. And that's at the, the crux of what I do with people every day. Yeah. That's wonderful. Thank you. And that's a great explanation. So um, where are you going to take us next? So I would love to go through, um, I'll try and reference some of the images. And if you get really stuck, I'll try and bring one up on my phone or I actually have some, okay. some not very good paper copies. But I wanted to go through nature calendars, nature altars, nature mandalas, and lunchtime art. Um, um, and also something about harvesting materials for some of the yeah. images you saw and also how how I have used nature um, in, in creative writing with clients for healing, especially. So I just wanted to touch on those five or six things. Um, and I don't have to spend a long time doing this, but I just wanted to give you a sense of Um, how those things were made. For example, the very first image you might remember was a round palette, and I read this Mm -hmm. in my pieces um, at the beginning of today's session, and there were seven rocks. And so I happened to, um, that's a nature calendar. It's placing one object per day on what I have is a round palette. You can see from the images, round is one of my things, round, curvy, spirally, um, circle shapes, anything like that. I'm I'm just very drawn to that um, sense of um, perpetualness maybe um, of of the round form. And so it comes out all the time in my work. Um, I, I take photos weekly of the nature calendar. Um, I've just taken the new I use them in my work. Um, A a person doesn't have to do that if they wanted to make a nature calendar. But for me, it's a round palette. When I first started doing this practice, it was a humongous round palette that was, I don't know, two or three feet um, uh, wide. And I had little circles of handmade paper, 31 of them for the longest months. And then I would find something outside sometimes it was the same item you know 31 somethings and each day i would place an object and as as i started moving around a lot and geographically actually moving my business and moving moving my home um that became a little bit cumbersome and also i was finding that i was really attracted to a smaller form so now i have a tiny little um disc about this big um smaller than a dinner plate maybe and um and then I, I photograph them every week, well, until the end of the month. So depending on how long the month is, right, that, that last um, photo might have more than seven new objects in it. But I like to do that regularly because it shows the progression. And I didn't do that here because I wanted to give people a variety um, about the nature calendar form. But it's a way of marking time, partly because it's round form, that takes us out of this, I'm pointing down at my wall calendar, the squares on a calendar, which I still think is so strange. (laughs) How did we come up with that system? Um, And and using, of course, the calendar for for work and things on my my various electronic devices. It's all in squares and lists and right angles. And so something about, you know, I'm being out on a walk or a hike and I look down and there's the perfect twig with moss on it and it happens to be a small little size and though I've had hundreds probably of twigs with moss on them over the years feature in these nature calendars I will pick it up and carefully you know often I I come home with a hand that's cramped in a certain position from holding something carefully or 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 pincer grasping a feather that I find Um, and I immediately go over and put it in the, the holding place for the nature calendar. Um, So I like that practice and I actually introduced that just kind of in passing to an interfaith group that I'm involved with here locally in a Zoom call. It was a recent meeting. Um, And one woman got so excited and said, oh my gosh, while I'm home, 
with my children and they can't go to school, we've decided, she, she decided for the family in the course of this meeting, that she was going to introduce this nature calendar practice to her family and that she and her kids were going to do this. And I haven't heard, I haven't touched back in with her to find out how that's going. But the great thing is, if you don't like how it's going, a person can rearrange it. You get to start over on the first day of the month. Um, and I like to refresh the objects. I don't, I do have some uh, dried flower petals and things that I've pressed and dried that I will use um, and that you saw in some of those images. But really, if I have a bouquet of flowers in my house um, or, or um, I mean, pretty much any, anything, you can use anything, uh, an orange peel, <laughs> a piece of an orange peel, a leaf uh, of rock, um, all of those items can, can be in service. And I really most often don't do them in a way that like the, the one with the seven rocks at the very first image of the slideshow. Um, I, I did not continue that entire month with rocks. Um, and sometimes it's really messy. I try not to show the messiest ones <laughs> that I've made 31 days and I'm not paying attention. And some of the items are too big and I'm stacking things on top of things. But it's a really nice way to pass the days. So that's nature calendars. And I would like to talk a minute about nature altars. Um, what I don't mean by nature altars, I don't mean that it has to be some sectarian religious um, kind of practice. What I simply mean, and I believe I said it something like this in the slideshow, that it's um, a way of using the natural world to mark or honor an occasion. And admittedly, some of those images um, that you saw in the, the nature altars um, part of the slideshow were, were actually honoring the birthdays of um, somebody who's passed away, a loved one who passed away, or actually marking the passing. Um, one of them was an image um, when my, my dog, my beloved dog, who was my companion for a decade and a half, um, passed away. She got very old and very ill and um, it was it was a big blow because we were we were very close. Some might say codependent, um, but we we I wanted to to honor her death in some way visually, and so I created one of the images that was in the slideshow. Um, and in fact, I'll tell you about that. I was on a beach and I was intending to make a, a to honor a death, and I went out and I saw a paw print in the sand. And I instantly knew that was the spot. It was about the size of my dog's paw print in the sand. Um, and so that became the center of that image was this paw print around which then I spiraled some rocks. Um, and that actually ended up turning into a different kind of, um, a different kind of nature altar. But I also build nature altars um, to mark seasons, the, the solstices and equinoxes. Mm -hmm. um, every year on New Year's Eve and or the first day of January, I do a, a kind of a turning over of the year, reflecting on the past year and bringing in the new year, um, honoring people's birthdays with handmade bouquets, even if it's not somebody who will ever receive that bouquet. Um, I, and it just is a, it, it's a way of, holding this space. And often I photograph them partly because I like some of the images I create. And sometimes I want to share that image if I know that that occasion is, is a special occasion for other people. Um, family members, for example, I'll take a photo so that I can then share that moment and that experience with them. Um, nature mandalas are a brand new practice that was the third series of images and the very first image you saw was a white background with a lot of little circle pieces and a few yeah. um, square rectangular pieces that practice is brand new it's happened since shelter in place began um and those images it would you you'd have to really um uh, expand the image to see but those each one of those little circles with one exception, there were a few um, images that were um, photographs of, of marbled paper <laughs> that I made. But most of the images were nature photographs that I printed out 
and then used uh, uh, a creative hole punch, a, a bigger size hole punch. I think most of those were an inch or a half inch size. And I punched out the, the nature photographs into little round pieces. And then I arranged those round pieces. And I found myself doing that one day. Actually, those round pieces were supposed to be for another project. And I started just kind of, I had a, a, a white piece of cloth. I started putting them on. Um, and I realized at the end that what I had was a mandala. The, the, the mandalas are um, a, a brand new form for me. They're very simple. You saw some, some flower images. Um, sometimes they're a little bit symmetrical, whatever that mm -hmm. means <laughs> with nature objects. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't strive to pick images that are all alike or exactly the same size or shape. That's just not what my eye is usually drawn to. Um, but I, I really enjoy doing that because it's not an outcome driven. I'm not aspiring to do something even that I like by the end of it. I'm just immersed in a pretty quiet meditative process of using whatever the either the nature images um, that are that I've punched into holes or um, or the the objects from nature, flowers, twigs, that sort of thing. And I actually, if I look back on it, I've probably been doing that a lot longer than since the shelter in place time but i named them um, in the last couple of months so um, and then one final thing i want to talk about in terms of the images is the lunchtime art and the very first image for that you might have noticed was um, uh, an orange peel i had <laughs> had an orange that day for lunch very literally it was it's lunchtime art and usually they're quick little creative projects i'm in the middle of the day and i'm focused on all of these other things that, maybe don't have anything to do with beauty or creativity. Um, and I need something. I'm craving touching natural objects. I'm craving seeing something pretty. And so I went out. I had this, I had challenged myself to peel the orange without breaking the half, uh, uh, oh. <laughs> what do you call it, the, the rind yes. on the orange. I'd cut it in half and then very, very carefully extracted the, the flesh so that I could eat it. And then I went outside and just saw a couple little flowers that were growing in my grass. Um, and I brought them in and I made that. And then I noticed myself over time making a few more of those. So I said, have several that are actually contained in little orange um, uh, peels over time. But, and, and also you saw something that looked like um, some sticks or something. Those were lavender wands. And I certainly wouldn't make all of those in one lunch time, but I did. I do find myself in July or so when the, the lavender is harvestable here on our property. Um, I'm able to take some of the lavender and a pretty ribbon and just kind of wind it up as a little activity to get me out of um, the other parts of my day for a few minutes. Um, I want to mention ethical harvesting, and I don't even know if ethical, that's such a fancy strict word. <laughs> um, but I really want to talk about what I do in terms of gathering these items and what I would recommend um, our participants today, if you want to try these activities, um, how you might do this. I, and, and I might not have even learned this from myself, right? I might have actually learned this from people I talked with who use natural resources in fine crafts making. Um, for example, when I did my doctoral research, that was um, some group of people I talked to to gather data for my research involved working with artisans who use natural resources or images in their work. And there was a broom maker, a traditional Appalachian broom maker, who was one of, of these dozens of people that I interviewed. Um, and I asked him, well, you know, you make, how, how many brooms do you make? Well, he made about, makes about 3,000 a year. I was thinking, 3,000 brooms, right? And I'm doing the math very quickly in my head. Math is in my strong suit and trying to do the math to figure out how many brooms a day is that. And, um, and I said, so, so where do you get these broom handles? Because they look beautiful and they're not, they, they're not like a, when you buy a broom at Ace Hardware or something, right? These are beautiful, curving. You can see knots in the wood. They're beautiful broom handles. I can't imagine people actually using them for, for a purpose of, of cleaning up a mess. Um, 
but I talked to him and I said, so where do you get these, these broom handles? And he said, well, it's great. You know, I've lived here my whole life. And I know that those guys, those guys, he called them, those guys are out there um, clearing the brush in, in early spring. You know, everything that's, that's been growing um, and, and gotten kind of out of control in the last few seasons, they go and they clean everything up on the roadsides. And boy, I'm out there. I know exactly what day they're going to be out there. And I follow their truck. And as they cut down the brush on the side of the road, I gather my broom handle. I thought, wow, that's fantastic, right? That's the perfect example of something that might later be chipped um, by those, those roadside um, uh, cleanup guys that, that maybe they would chip those or throw them in some compost heap. And, and all of those ways of, of taking care of the broom handles also could be to good sustainable effect. Um, but the fact that the man was taking them just as they were, trimming off a few stray things here and there, and then shaping them and polishing them and, and covering them with some kind of um, oil or something so that they would were, were safe for people to use um, was just amazing to me. And so what I would say is if you're going out to do these projects, really pay attention to where you are especially if you're in um, like a protected area, you probably don't want to be taking things. So please pay attention. Um, if, if you're a young person that is not a grown up, if you're a kid and you're on this call, think, look at what you see out there and think about just taking one or two of something. Um, if you go out in a field and you see hundreds of dandelions, it's probably okay to pick a few of those if you want to use them in your project. Um, and also, I bet a few seeds will fly off even as you're picking them, so then there will be some more regeneration. But um, not taking anything that's uh, a protected resource, or if you're in a place where there are restrictions on collecting, I would ask you to please um, pay attention to those things. Also, to not take everything of what you see. If you get permission from your neighbor to have a rose off their bush to use for your project because you want to pick off the rose petals or something, that's fantastic. And I would be so glad if you asked permission first. Um, and, and wait until you get the yes answer, not just assume that they're going to say yes, but also to to think about the plant that you're taking this thing from. And even, um, we all have varying um, understandings of how sentient, that is how aware or, or how much a, a plant might be able to um, know that we're taking something from it, but to just be thoughtful about that. Um, also, a lot of these things I do, particularly because I make a lot of these creations outside, um, there was something that looked like a little bouquet in the grass that actually was a bouquet in the grass. It was one thing that was already growing there that looked too precious to pick, but I picked some other more, um, some things that were plentiful kind of um, um, grass weeds and, and flowers for one of the projects that I, I shared a picture of earlier today. And I took those things I picked over to the place where this other thing was still growing in the ground. And I was able to stand things up in the unmown grass in a way that it looked like a bouquet, but only one of those items was actually still growing in the, in the ground. And often if I'm on a beach or something, I, I know that nature is going to um, do what nature does and winds will come and creatures will come. And um, I wrote about this in, in one of the books that I read from today um, about how, you know, processes happen. And for me, when I'm making something outside, I expect that it's not going to be there too long, that the forces of nature, including other humans, are going to come by and maybe move things around. And so um, if I want to take a photograph, I take it right away before I leave the place. Um, but also about this, this harvesting is um, if you take something, a big pile of rocks, and you displace them from where you got them, that's, that is maybe you go to the tide line and you take a lot of rocks and you carry them up onto some grass at, a, at the park that adjoins the beach, you might want to think about when you're done with your project, taking those rocks back down to the beach where they may be approximately where you found them. Um, just to kind of help the natural world keep its order <laughs> so we don't displace too many things. Um, 
And also for me, I like to express gratitude. I like to say thank you to that being or thing, if you don't believe it's a being, in nature from which I've borrowed something. Um, I've spent a lot of time recently at a red cedar tree in the forest uh, a few minutes walk from where I live. And I've been going to that tree and um, making requests and offering some gratitudes to that tree in the last couple of months since we've been in this um, unique time that we're in. And um, it, it feels good now. I feel like that guy is kind of my buddy. <laughs> I can go to that tree and, and say, hello, how you doing today, Red Cedar? That's his name, his or her name. And, um, and then maybe put my hands up on the tree. I actually dared to venture to um, hug the tree the other day. I got all sap all over, but it didn't matter. It, was, it felt good to see how sturdy that tree was. So those are, are some of the ways that I think about um, using natural resources that, that I, I like to think about it as borrowing. I like to think about not taking as much as there is available, seemingly available in a moment, and certainly not taking something that cannot replenish in a healthy way. So even staying away from the word sustainable, since there's so many variations on that word. So I'll take a little pause and I'd love to see if people have questions at this point. They can be typed into the chat box or if you have questions or comments, Barbara or Zoe. I'm looking to see if there are not any questions yet, but maybe while they're um, while they're typing in their questions, just a couple of things I, I noticed. Um, I, I like the idea of well, nature, you know, the, 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 the curves and the circles suggest cycles rather than linear time. And I like that, you know, and, I, and I'm with you on the calendars, the square calendars. Um, I understand that makes me crazy. Um, and the, the mandalas, um, because when we had we had the privilege of hosting the Dalai Lama here in Wisconsin, and um, he was part of our uh, Compassionate Cities campaign. And I was able to um, accompany the monks to go and hear him talk. And of course, we talked about mandalas. So mandalas are very familiar. Um, and, and in in Buddhism and Hinduism too, they teach about the impermanence of life. And that is, you know, the underlying principles of the mandala is that, you know, when these monks make the mandalas out of sand, is then they take, they deconstruct it so that we understand about the impermanence of biology and the impermanence of life. Yes, actually, I so appreciate you mentioning that because it reminds me, we were talking before this call started, I'm saying this now to the participants, about the Parliament of the World's Religions that the Charter right. Foundation has been involved with for years, and that I had the great um, honor and pleasure of attending in 2015 in Salt Lake City. And there were some Tibetan monks who were there mm -hmm. in the front of this incredibly huge, beautiful, sacred made, remade convention center with, with the little pockets of um, um, sacred areas where people could go and um, experience beauty of all sorts from religions of all, all kinds. And um, the Tibetan monks were right in the front and they started out on the first day, right? It was a very basic um, looking thing with not a lot of color and it just got more and more and more elaborate. And I took more photos than, than I can even believe of that process over the days. And it reminded me what you've said just now and what that experience and also some native ceremonies that I've had the honor yeah. of attending over the years, where there are also colored sand rituals. Um, that there's, I, I heard of a practice, I mean, maybe in my 20s even, and it, I, I can't remember um, who the people are, but it's a, a, a small group of people in India, I believe, um, okay. not part of the world anyway, and every morning, the practice is that the woman, the, the mom or the wife or the, the, the female um, head of the house goes out to the door stoop just outside the, the front door of the home and creates an artwork, usually made of sand, colored sand, and then leaves it there. 
And because it's the front stoop, as the children go off to school and as her husband, um, you know, goes off to, to his job and as grandma and grandpa are coming in and out during the day, that artwork over the, the day, the sand becomes dispersed and then it's back to looking like the, the front stoop, not like a piece of art. And I, I've held on to that. I, mean, I can't remember the source. I can't remember the name of the people, but I've held on to that image and how beautiful if we all made a piece of something simple or elaborate for a few minutes in the beginning of every day and let just the, the tasks and the, the hours of the day kind of wear it down um, and, and displace all of that back into the environment and then the next morning create the beauty again. And though I think it's really cool, I've never, <laughs> never had a sustained practice of that, but I think about it. I think about it almost every day for all these, all these years since I heard about it. I've done that too, that same thing with writing prompts and let whatever it is suggest to me what it wants, what voice it wants and what it wants to say. Yeah. That's wonderful, yeah. wonderful practice. Um, and I thought about um, the shapes in nature. You know, there, there's something about nature that is completely elegant in terms of the geometry that's incorporated in, in, in it and in terms of um, the flow that's incorporated and how things come together. And there's not a it's a, it's like it's not a deliberate placement, but it's an evolutionary placement, if you know what I mean, that um, there's something about that that really um, can really speak to human beings, you know, and and give us that, you know, sort of a refreshing breath and and maybe a tiny rebirth for the day. So I, re I remember um, I was on retreat one time and I remember um, and I remember this very vividly. It was a number of years ago, but there was a it was like. Um, at the edge of winter. So it was like winter was winding down a little bit. And I saw this leaf and the leaf had been frozen, uh, you know, little thin ice had the leaf had been frozen and was emerging from the ice. And I stood there and looked at that. I can't tell you how long I looked at that leaf, but the whole universe opened up in that leaf. And I know you know what I'm talking about, but it was yeah. like, yeah, it was like I had never seen anything so beautiful in my life. And it spoke volumes, just that little leaf. So just that simple act of doing that and, and, and letting it suggest to you, what is the meaning in this or what, what am I trying to convey here? Yes. And I, I appreciate you saying that too. So I, I can feel how how our lives and our sensitivity <laughs> to the natural world are very similar, Barbara. And I, two examples of that for me, I, I went out on a, one of my hikes, which is one of the things I've been doing recently to um, clear my head, let's say, <laughs> during these times. Um, yeah. Out and there's a place, there are a couple different places on the, on the other side of the forest where there are um, neighborhoods that I, if I want to get a little more mileage on my feet, I can extend my walk. And so the other day I was extending out um, north of here and I passed the same rhododendron bush I've passed dozens and dozens and dozens of times in recent weeks. And is blooming and that it had been blooming before, but I, there was this activity and I wasn't walking mm -hmm. at a different time of day than normal. Usually it's in the morning. And I, I walked out and there were, there was a low hum and there were these beautiful, beautiful honeybees and they were mm -hmm. all, they were going in every single, and not just in a little bit. I mean, tucking themselves so far inside each flower that they became a dark shadow, um, which I only know mm -hmm. because sat there for a long time trying to photograph them. Um, I didn't have my, my great camera, but just using my phone camera. And I just became kind of immersed. I wasn't thinking hardly. I wasn't 
maybe even feeling as as an emotions but i was just my eyes were riveted and i was watching them swirl around and sometimes i was trying to capture a a, a photo i took a, a a fun little video um, of one of the bees and um, you know touring around this flower and and pushing on the the stamen um in, in a way that looked like um uh, people in a uh, playing a, an organ the oh. organ i was like wow he's playing that flower he's not just trying to get some some nourishment from it um but it was it was fascinating and i left and i proceeded with my walk when when somehow i like woke up to that i was actually supposed to be walking and hiking had a whole day of work in front of me that maybe i wasn't going to spend all day standing at that rhododendron bush um and i thought for a second i asked myself the question how long were you standing there and instantly mm-hmm. I knew I couldn't answer and I most especially knew in my heart that it didn't matter. Mm-hmm. And that whatever needed to get done that day would get done. So that's one example. The other example of immersion in the moment is just yesterday, my neighbor um, next door said, oh my gosh, what do I do? Uh, a little Junko is, is out of his nest. And I was thinking, well, I, I know what we should do. I'm thinking in my head, we should put it back in, right? Well, as soon as I walked over to the shed, the garden shed, where there were not just, there wasn't just one, there were two juncos who had come out of the nest. Um, and they were tiny, tiny little guys, the junco, the, the, the dark-eyed junco or organ junco, um, variously known as both names here, um, is, is a very common bird. And over the years, I've written about them a lot and watched the nests and watched the eggs and watched this whole process. And we have many, many nests on this property over the each, each spring junco nest. And so one was in the garden shed. It was just high enough that there was no way, even if I very carefully scooped up a bird, um, that I was going to get him back in the nest. And also, I'm really, uh, I, I, I try so hard not to intervene when I think that nature is so grand and glorious and really can take care of itself most of the time. Anyway, I went out there and there were these two little guys and one of them definitely had wings and though he couldn't fly high, he definitely was able to fly enough to get up to the top of a bucket and could probably stair step himself back up into that nest. And the other guy at least could run really, really fast (laughs) around the shed. So I knew that he was, he would probably be okay. And there's a place where mom could come in and feed them even if they weren't in the nest, she'd probably still feed them on the ground. So we we opted not to um, oh. intervene in this situation, which was fine. And then as I came out, I went to the weedy place right behind where um, in the gravel where I parked my car. And I looked down and it was a moment, one of those moments that caught me as if the, the baby birds weren't glorious enough. I looked down and I just stopped in my tracks. And there was a, uh, I, I believe there are these um, little yellow tiny, tiny, tiny little spiders. I forget what they're called. They might even be called yellow spiders. I don't know, but they build these this time of year all around. And um, they're not super favorable to have around. They do things that people don't like. But anyway, I wasn't going to disturb it. But I looked down and on this nest, though it was sunny by that time in the afternoon, it had rained here in the morning. And I looked down and it just looked like jewels, jewels all over this, um, this web. And I tried to capture it with my phone camera and I was not fully mm. sure. Then I went out this morning and tried again with a better camera to see if I could actually capture the effect. But it was that moment again where I have no idea. I, I was there five seconds or three minutes. I don't know. But it was being captivated. And I have to say that I feel, believe, and I'll be so arrogant as to say I know that we are a part of nature. And so those moments where we're caught, you know, we're captivated by a web, we're caught in the action of the, the swarm of bees. Um, never once did it occur to me one of the bees might land on me or, or sting mm-hmm. me. That, that just wasn't a thought. Then they weren't there for me. Um, but I, I, it reminds me how connected we are. We forget there's a huge amnesia, um, I think, um, about our connection with the natural world. But gosh, we are. And every time we need to eat something or sleep or, um, you know, go to the bathroom, we're reminded, oh, yep, we're nature, right? These are things we can't change. We must have water every day. We must have nourishment. We must rest. Um, 
So we are connected. So I think these creative projects we do is a can be a very tangible and often aesthetically pleasing way to re to remember that connection to reconnect on a really really visceral level or a portal uh, back to the self mm. even yeah um, I, know, I know what you're saying because it's like three minutes two minutes an hour an eternity doesn't matter when yeah. you're in one of those moments yeah that's mm. great that's great so um so we talked a little bit about ethical harvesting and then you use nature a lot in your writing. So using nature in creative writing, you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. And I'll be brief because I'd love to open it up for questions um, for okay. people too, or Barbara, if you have more questions. Um, yeah. Let me, let me check the last. chat room here. And I don't know if questions, I see a little Q and a box. I don't know if questions are going in there too, or if they're only going in the chat. Not so far. I think everybody's okay. enchanted. <laughs> oh, or, or, or taking a nice happy doze in the middle of the, <laughs> the lunch, their lunch break for the day. Um, yes, I'll talk about uh, nature and creative writings or in any kind of writing. So I use the, the whole, as I said, crux of my uh, professional work right now is um, though I love doing these creative things, visually, visual art, creative things. The crux of my work really is writing. And part of that is the content I develop, books and articles and blogs and things like that, that I write. Um, but it is also guiding people who are often who are hurting um, or who are stuck or who are blocked in their writing or are in some kind of creative impasse, or maybe they're in a big life transition. And it's doing work with those um, with those folks, usually one on one, um, to to help them move through that impasse, through that stuckness, um, through the grief, through the the hardship. Um, and so often, what I do is um, have objects from the natural world. Either I've collected them, or the person I'm working with has collected them. Or we can have an experience sometimes out in the natural world, either both of us via Zoom, leaving the computer for a minute and going outside, or if we're together in a natural place, um, using the natural world in that way, and also using images like some of the photos you saw. The, um, there was a, a caption to the effect of um, using these the photograph for writing, writing about the photograph. And so what I often do with people is pair an image with a writing prompt. I'm, I'm not a, I have to say, I'm not a huge fan of writing prompts, just kind of as a general principle. And I get that they're really, really useful at some points, um, probably for all of us. Um, I, I'm not one of those people that probably will write a book of, of writing prompts, um, though they're very popular and they're very handy for a lot of folks. Um, I will often, given what the person is presenting, say a client of mine, as, as an issue or an impasse, I will actually listen to what they're saying and think of a question about that and then um, offer them the question and offer them a photograph. And I, I, I do that in a number of various ways, but for example, uh, let's see if I can find the image. Oh wait, I can probably show you from these hard copies. There's an image I used for the client recently. And you asked Barbara before we started today if I could share some examples without breaking anonymity because of course the work I do with clients is um, <laughs> confidential. But I will hold up this image. You'll see there a red image. That's one of the writing prompts um, images. I held that up. It was a, a shinier image actually on photo paper um, to, to my client um, when he was in, in a stuck place with his writing. And this is a, a very astute person who was writing his second or third book um, and had all of the content and the outline and the, the book deal with the, with the um, uh, traditional publisher and just needed a little bit of support as he went through that process. So one day when he was stuck, I held that up and I didn't say what the image was. I just held it up and gave him a writing prompt that was appropriate to, to his, his, uh, where he was stuck that day. And at the end of a very short free write, maybe 15 minutes or something, he had, um, he, th he looked at that image and said that it was, for him, it was candles. Um, it's actually an image from the natural world, but, but um, he saw it as candles. And that became a whole 
thing for him. The candles, the fire, matches, um, the role of fire in his life. And the thing that he was stuck about, this was, this was a, a wonderful, happy occasion for us. The thing that he was actually stuck about at the beginning of the session, he had some clarity around and knew the next step he needed to take from doing a free write based on the natural world. And what I will say, I will just follow that up with a PS, which is that I've done this work now in a lot of different contexts, including in the top of skyscrapers in downtown San Francisco in a fancy boardroom with a big shiny wood table, like you might imagine seeing in a boardroom polished and everything. And here I came from the Pacific Northwest, trudging down with a suitcase full of dirty seaweed rocks, bark, twigs, leaves, pollen, all kinds of things, and spread it out on this shiny polished table. And attorneys came in after a long day at work for this workshop that I was offering. And they, um, it was a workshop training kind of thing. And they came in and they took off their coats and they rolled up their sleeves and they started touching dirty rocks and seaweed and they wrote um, based on some prompts I offered, and they too were able to come to something, to connect with something a little deeper. So there are many, many ways that I pair, um, and I've, I, so I've done it with natural objects, I've done it with photos of nature, and I've done it with actually sending people out in natural landscapes, um, and and with with an intention, with a question as they go out, paying attention to what they see around them. And people come back and they tell their story and um, and then we work with that. So there are infinite, infinite ways to use the natural world to to and I say use, I don't mean that in a in in a bad way, like nature is just there to service us, right? <laughs> um, I want to have more respect than that, but that that we can we can avail ourselves of these opportunities. Of, of both inspiration um, from the natural world. Uh, we can use, sometimes I, I see something happen in nature with a bird nest and I don't know the answer. I'm not um, a, a naturalist. I don't know everything about life cycles of certain kinds of species or something like that. So I do research. I come back because I have a question and I do research and that research might then end up looking like facts in an article I write or in in a blog post. Um, so the, the actual direct experience of the natural world comes back into writing a lot for me, and sometimes for my clients as well. Thank you for sharing that. That was a wonderful story. And I know um, I still don't have any questions, but I but I wanted you to continue just for a few minutes because we're we're at we're past the top of the hour, but that's fine. I'm um, really enjoying um, speaking to you. It's, this has been a joy, and I'm sure it is for a lot of people who maybe at this time, you know, the world has stopped. Basically, we're only getting started again, and and what I would like to see is not the same old, same old, and not going back to quote unquote normal, but going back to something that's richer, um, and and that respects you know nature and the earth and our biology and makes us remember that we are part of that biology. Um, and, and I've seen people have those reflections that I don't want to interpret that for them, but I can see it. You know that a connection has been made so I think that's wonderful um, I don't I know that it's confidential and I know you can't say a lot about um, when you're working with people who are transitioning but do you want to talk a little bit about that just um, something that you can tell us about that because that is really um, having had a background in nursing I can appreciate that and that is really a different kind of work, um, and it's so gentle and so comforting that I don't know if you can say anything about that without identifying anyone, but tell us what you do um, when you volunteer. Okay, so you're you're referencing the, the volunteer work, my hospice work. Right, right, hospice. Oh, because yeah. I also do some, some bit of that 
um, yeah. as well. But yes, so I've been a hospice volunteer for 20 years. Um, I started very, very young. And of course, like most people who, who start in with hospice work, um, I had a story. We all have a story. And in fact, when you mm -hmm. go to hospice, most often for people when they when they show up at a hospice training, one of the first things we do is share the story of why we're there. Um, and mine was a personal story of loss. And so I, I went and I got trained to be a hospice volunteer. Um, and I didn't, I mean, I really didn't know much about hospice before that. I didn't have any notion when I went to that very first training and I've, I've attended a lot of trainings over the years of various sorts and if I've moved around sometimes I've as I've signed up with a new hospice sometimes finding the hospice I can volunteer with before I've actually found the house to live in, um, oh. in the very literally um, I have I have had to go through training you know the, the whole training again based on state regulations and, and that particular hospice so I've been I've been through a lot of trainings um, and it's, I, I had no idea when I started in that very first training how easily the work would come, how um, ready I was for it, and how ready it was for me, perhaps. Um, and I love that. I mean, there is, so, so every situation is different. I, somebody just asked me the other day, and I can't remember who, and it probably doesn't matter, um, asked the question, do I do hospice work? Um, only in people's homes or only in facilities and I do both and um, sometimes I like to say that I prefer going into people's homes partly because that's where things are familiar for the family or the person who is um, moving toward death um, who may or may not be actually to that last stage of transitioning um, crossing over um, but there, I think one of the things I most love about it, first of all, it's a natural process and it's, we're all headed in that direction. I, I don't mean to be morbid, um, but, it, but it is part of life and death, which is why I, I'm so struck by the seasons and what's happening out there and how that relates to life cycles. Um, and, and I've brought the natural world, these very things we've been talking about for mm -hmm an hour and a half now I have brought into the hospice setting and I have a couple of articles if people are interested they can write to me later send an email and I'd be happy to send you links to these articles about how we actually um, can use nature objects and photos in the natural world in and in service to hospice work um, but I but I think that that it, it, it's such a parallel it's so embedded and intertwined with the natural world that um, it's a comfortable place for me. Every situation is different. Um, you know, it's, it's work that requires me, like how I strive to be when I'm in the natural world, that requires me to be utterly present now. And I have rituals I do, some of which are in these articles I just referenced, um, about what I do before I get out of my car when I re reach somebody's home or um, a facility that, that somebody might be staying in until they pass away. And um, how I need to put the other things in my schedule aside for now and breathe and maybe even close my eyes and just remember because walking in to a hospice situation even yeah. if I've been with the same family and with the same person who is dying for months and months which has been the case sometimes it's still always an unknown what is going to be happening when I walk in um, is it going to be a good day or a bad day is so beyond um, it, it, it's so inconsequential actually it's really about stepping in and not knowing what the landscape of those hours that day are going to look like with the family with with the, the person who is dying and so part of that is the the fresh newness of i don't know what's going to happen so there's almost stuff it, it it forces me to be present and aware but it also um allows me to serve using whatever tools and practices I can think of in a moment to be best of service to that family without relying on some prescribed way of being. And I found myself doing things that are, are um, not particularly habits for me or even particularly within my um, uh, belief system. For example, um, 
I'll, I'll see if I can say this with as few details as possible to protect everybody. Um, somebody I knew of through somebody I know, <laughs> um, so someone I didn't know, an acquaintance related to somebody I know was dying. And I said I'd be happy to go and sit for a little bit. Well, it turns out I was there on this person's very last day. Mm. Um, they ended up passing an hour or two after I left. So I was the last person to be with the person who was dying. And I went in and this person I knew was um, had a lot of interests that were different than mine, but I took one of those and, and the person was really moving to the other side. So there wasn't a, a, a two-way conversation. Um, but I was very quiet and very still, and there was minimal, some minimal touch um, that, that seemed okay. Um, and I sang, and I sang mm -hmm. things that are not, I, so I don't sing in public. I'm the one who whispers happy birth, the happy birthday song when <laughs> everyone else is singing loudly. <laughs> um, but I, but I, it, it just, I knew in that moment it was the thing to do. And so I thought, well, you know, I have a voice and probably no one's going to walk in and say, wow, that really sounds pretty off key and terrible. So I just went for it. And I happened to know a few um, hymns that were within this person's tradition. So I sang them over and over and over very slowly for a long time until I couldn't sing anymore. Um, that's the kind of showing up that we can do not just with people who are dying, we can do it every day with our friends and family who are hurting. We can do it um, when we're out in the natural world and just really want to take a few moments to notice the bees on the rhododendron bush. Um, but, but I feel like those skills and those sensitivities are very translatable, whether it's a meditative art project or a hike in the, in the woods. It looks like there's some- Okay, problems. yeah. Um... Let me check and see. Um, Melissa says, I think one of your recent blog articles talked about using natural objects in your hospice work. You've taken objects from the natural world into the hospice patient. For example, a leaf, a special flower, the person's favorite flower. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a comfort. Um, and then Susan says, this hour has been calming and healing and therapeutic for my soul. Many thanks for this gift. Yeah, and I would like to thank you, too. I, I wanted you to do that because, um, talk about it a little bit, because we have now come full circle. Mm -hmm. There's that circle again. There's that um, another season of life, if you will. Today is another day. It's another season. It's another learning experience and opportunity and so on. So thank you so much for that. And um yeah. Oh, it's been great. So if people want to um, see some of your work, they can go to tealarborstories.com. Um, are there other places? You, you, you're on, you have a YouTube channel, do you not? I do have a I YouTube have channel. And if this Charter for Compassion um, uh, webinar time today is recorded, I can get that onto my, I think I can get it onto my YouTube channel as well. I have a couple yeah. of um, Charter for Compassion things that I've been able to translate over to my channel. So I have a YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. um, I have a blog that has a lot of, um, I think of them as less formal writings. It's it's less formal than a book. It's really what's up for me in the moment. And I type it out very quickly and put it up on the blog. And I'm doing a special thing on the blog right now. The blog is, um, I can't remember the address, but if you go into my website, you'll see a little orange box with a stylized mm -hmm. white beam. That's the symbol for blog. Um, or you can type in Teal Arbor Stories blog and get there that way. It's on blogspot.com. Um, and, and in there, I'm doing a, a thing. I don't know how long I will continue. I might be winding it up soon. But over the last couple of months, I've been doing something called Hearth, which is something mm -hmm. I post very short on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and some Saturdays. Thank you. Someone just posted my blog. Yeah. Thank you, Melissa. Okay, good. Um, I remember my own blog address. Right? <laughs> um, I've been posting something called Hearth, and it's um, usually a very short little practice or a video, a, a short little video or a photo with a little uh, bit of writing just to help 
to offer a little bit of nourishment to people during this challenging, for some of us, challenging time. So there are lots of ways to find my work. The website has volumes of things that, <laughs> that um, people can look at. I offer classes and, and other kinds of things too. So it's all there. And of course, if people want to have a conversation with me about anything that we talked about today, or you have questions about how to um, do any of these creative projects, or you want to know more, or you just, whatever, feel free to e email me. Um, the email is a, the same version of the website and the blog in terms of the address. It's tealherberstories at gmail.com. And that's also yeah. linked to it from my website. So. Yeah, and I'm Teal is T E A L Arbor mm -hmm. uh, A R B O R stories dot com. Yes. Yep. Yeah. And for you it's it's at Gmail, correct? Correct. Okay. Yeah. yeah, well this has been a delight, Jennifer. Thank you so much for being with us. So um much. yeah, and, and again, if you want to look at um some of Jennifer's work, go to uh Teal Arbor Stories. We also I think you have a page on the charter. Um I do, and, and then um, her YouTube, she has some um, some videos there. And then just, um, if you have enjoyed this, uh, we at the Charter for Compassion will like to continue bringing you programming. And you can go to the um, charterforcompassion.org, and there's a little orange button that says Donate, and you can donate to the Charter on there. So thank you once again. It's been a delightful hour. Thank you for everyone who, yes, everyone who attended and um, keep shining. <laughs> thank you so much. And for those of you who spent your lunch hour with me, with us, thank you so much. It's been great to do. Um, namaste. Thanks, Barbara. Namaste.